Well, the breaking news of the night is that Donald Trump has been gagged again. After a flurry of new filings at the end of the day from District Attorney Alvin Bragg asking Judge Juan Marchand to expand his gag order and Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers filing their objection to expanding the gag order, claiming that Donald Trump did nothing wrong this weekend in attacking Judge Marchand's daughter, Judge Marchand granted the district attorney's request to expand the gag order, which now forbids Donald Trump from commenting on the judge's family or the district attorney's family. Their families were not previously covered by the gag order. The judge also warned Donald Trump, as requested by the district attorney, that if he continues to disrupt the case, Donald Trump will lose his legal right as a defendant to even know the names of his jurors in the case. The first line of District Attorney Alvin Bragg's filing in the case tonight says, quote, defendant's dangerous, violent, and reprehensible rhetoric fundamentally threatens the integrity of these proceedings and is intended to intimidate witnesses and trial participants alike, including this court. The district attorney is asking the judge to clarify or confirm that his previous gag order on Donald Trump, quote, protects family members of the court, the district attorney, and all other individuals mentioned in the order. District Attorney Bragg pointed out that a social media account that Donald Trump publicly ascribed to Judge Mershon's daughter was, quote, a fraudulent impersonation. The district attorney added, quote, there is no constitutional right to target the family of this court, let alone on the blatant falsehoods that have served as the flimsiest pretexts for defendants' attacks. Defendant knows that he, what he is doing, and everyone else does too. The harm to the orderly administration of this proceeding is magnified by the high likelihood that potential witnesses, prospective jurors, and other trial participants will observe defendants' attacks and understand that if this court's family is fair game, then so are theirs. This issue is not complicated. Family members of trial participants must be strictly off limits. Defendants' insistence to the contrary bespeaks a dangerous sense of entitlement to instigate fear and even physical harm to the loved ones of those he sees in the courtroom. In Donald Trump's criminal attorney's reply brief, they point out that the current gag order plainly does not apply to family members of the court and the district attorney. And that, of course, is why the district attorney was asking the court to expand the gag order. And so that, and that is what the court decided to do. Trump's criminal defense lawyers argued in their filing that Donald Trump's comments about the judge's daughter working for Democratic political campaigns officially became part of the case. When the Trump lawyers used that as a reason for Judge Mershon to recuse himself in a recusal motion that Judge Mershon denied, the Trump lawyers argued, quote, Trump's comments concerning Judge Mershon's daughter are properly understood a criticism of the court's prior decision not to recuse itself. The challenged Social media posts reflect Trump's exercise of core constitutional rights under the First and Sixth Amendment. The advocacy was also necessary and appropriate in the current environment. At 7.58 p.m. tonight, Judge Mershon issued his decision and order. The judge quoted the Trump lawyer's defense that Trump's statements, quote, plainly constitute core political speech on matters of great public concern and criticism of major public figures, to which the judge said, quote, attacking family members of presiding jurists and attorneys assigned to his cases serves no legitimate purpose. It merely injects fear in those assigned or called to participate in the proceedings, that not only they, but their family members as well are fair game for defendants' vitriol. Judge Mishan quoted the district attorney in his filing saying, quote, Multiple potential witnesses have already expressed grave concerns about their own safety and that of their family members should they appear as witnesses against defendant. That led Judge Mershon to this conclusion. It is no longer just a mere possibility or a reasonable likelihood that there exists a threat 
to the integrity of the judicial proceedings. The threat is very real. Admonitions are not enough, nor is reliance on self-restraint. The average observer must now, after hearing defendants' recent attacks, draw the conclusion that if they become involved in these proceedings, even tangentially, they should worry not only for themselves, but for their loved ones as well. Such concerns will undoubtedly interfere with the fair administration of justice and constitutes a direct attack on the rule of law itself. Again, all citizens called upon to participate in these proceedings, whether as a juror, a witness, or in some other capacity, must now concern themselves, not only with their own personal safety, but with the safety and the potential for personal attacks upon their loved ones. That reality cannot be overstated. Judge Mershon accused Trump's defense lawyers of, quote, baseless misrepresentations that, quote, result in accusations that are disingenuous and not rational to argue that the most recent attacks, which included photographs, were necessary and appropriate in the current environment is farcical. The judge found that, quote, there exists no less restrictive means to prevent such risk to the proceedings. Judge Mershon gave Donald Trump this warning. Defendant is hereby put on notice that he will forfeit any statutory right he may have to access juror names if he engages in any conduct that threatens the safety and integrity of the jury or the jury selection process. And leading off our discussion tonight is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. She's an MSNBC legal analyst and co-host of the podcast Sisters in Law. Also with us, Harry Littman, former U.S. attorney and former deputy assistant attorney general. He is the senior legal affairs columnist for the Los Angeles Times. And Joyce, uh, let me just get your reaction to what you read in uh, Judge Mershon's order tonight. You know, this is very serious, Lawrence. We see these orders from judges day in and day out, but every once in a while you read an order and the language stops you cold. This is a judge who has had enough. He's not reacting in an emotional way. It's extremely measured. It's well-grounded in the law. As you pointed out, he lays it out step by step, and then he concludes that there's nothing less restrictive he can do. So he, in essence, admonishes Trump that if he crosses the line again, he will face criminal contempt. He cites to the statutory provisions in New York law that um, permit judges to invoke criminal contempt. And there are two possible penalties. One is a fine, and the amount is so de minimis that I imagine if we get to that point, the district attorney's office will say, this dollar amount clearly won't do anything to deter Trump. And the other option is custody. The judge can put a defendant who's found in criminal contempt in jail for up to 30 days. Now, look, this is an extraordinary step, and I'm still not certain that we imagine that the former president will be jailed pending trial. But the judge has laid it out clearly and said that Donald Trump is attacking the heart of the rule of law with deliberate conduct. So if he continues to do it, if the judge finds that he does it with the intent to material influence or impede the trial, the judge has told Donald Trump what comes next. And uh, Harry Lippman, I have to say, when I was reading the judge's order, it made me um, kind of work back through what led to this. And it, and it reads as if this really might not have been possible until tonight. It's like the judge was waiting. If he was going to do this, he was going to need more. He was going to have to see the threat developed so that he could get to the point of writing credibly in his order, the threat is very real. That's exactly right. And he wants to try to be dispassionate, as Joyce says, because he doesn't want to look as if he's personally exercised because it involves his daughter. And there, and Trump over the, you know, had 70 some uh, uh, tweets or social uh, media over the weekend, including pictures of the the daughter. But it's both that his what's happened recently, but also the judge has a new arrow in his quiver that that they didn't have in D.C. and that is really everywhere in the order, which is the upcoming trial. 
two weeks from today. So all the points he makes about people's being cowed, about participating in proceedings have real bite and constitutional force because he can say, there's a trial in front of us that you are threatening to uh, prejudice and undo and frighten the participants of. That gives him the extra leverage that, say, uh, Judge Chutkin in D.C. wouldn't have had yet. And I think it's a game changer, basically, for the rationale that that uh, permits him to do uh, th this very thing. Now, one more, one thing to add to what Joyce said, it's always tricky with Trump. You don't want to put him in jail. What are the steps? But he, the judge puts in his order this very interesting point. Maybe you'll lose your statutory, that is not constitutional right, to know jurors' names. That would hurt, because from knowing the names, you learn a lot about individual jurors, and that's a creative kind of threat that isn't down the line of, we're going to put you in jail, which pretty much everyone wants to avoid if possible. Uh, Joyce, we, we had plenty to talk about uh, just on the filings that we got at the end of the day uh, from District Attorney Bragg and the Trump defense lawyers. Uh, but what happened with the judge's order is he basically adopted all of these arguments being made by the district attorney that I was going to be asking you about. How did, do you think he's going to adopt this? Uh, especially the argument that this is not just about the judge's daughter. This is about every potential juror who comes into that courtroom, every potential witness who might be called, who's out there thinking, if this guy can attack the judge's daughter, imagine what he can do to me and imagine what he can do to my family. And that was the real threatening aspect of what Trump was doing that the district attorney persuaded the judge he had to take action against. Yeah, that's exactly right, because jurors don't have long-term protection like judges' daughters probably will be able to access. And this is a very real threat. The DA pointed it out in their briefing that they've had witnesses tell them that they're getting concerned. Potential jurors are often concerned. Harry and I have both dealt with situations like this, but no one with as public of a megaphone as Trump, with someone who has a demonstrable impact on his followers, so jurors would literally have to be looking over their shoulder in fear. And you know, Lawrence, this goes beyond what's happening in this trial. This ties back in to the sorts of targeting that, that Donald Trump is doing on social media of people up to and including the president. And we're at the point where a judge simply has to say, enough is enough, I will find a way to hold this man accountable or we can't in good faith ask jurors and witnesses to go in and play their roles in these trials. Uh, and Harry, the, the Trump lawyers uh, filing to this judge tonight, arguing that our client has a perfect right to attack your daughter whenever he wants to, uh, that is legitimately part of this case. Uh, that, that, that didn't get anywhere with this judge. Farcical. He called it. Yes, farce. there is no legitimate purpose. He called it. So the notion that there's some, and he gave a lot of peons in the opinion mm -hmm. to Trump's right to have First Amendment criticism, et cetera, et cetera. But this kind of vilification and sort of gutter rant about the judge's daughter has one zero First Amendment value and two true risk, as Joyce was just detailing, to a trial that is about to begin. He swatted it away, but I think he did it in a way that is, uh, he wants to not open himself up to any mm -hmm. accusation on appeal that he's getting personally engaged in it, and he didn't. It's sober, it's grounded in the law, and it just says there's nothing on your side. And really, he's contemptuous of Trump's uh, you know, suggestions that this is core political speech. And there's something really big on the other side, all the witnesses, et cetera, mm -hmm. as you were just detailing. Harry Littman and Joyce Vance, thank you very much for starting off our discussions tonight. Thanks, Joyce. Thank you. And more of the breaking news of the night. Donald Trump managed to post the $175 million bond in his New York civil fraud judgment against him for the $464 million judgment that he is appealing. Joining us now is Dan Alexander. He's a senior editor, editor at Forbes. Dan, how did Donald Trump do it? Uh, who gave him the money? Well, he did it with the help of a group called Knight Specialty Insurance Company. 
Now, this is a group that falls under the umbrella of companies owned by a guy named Don Hankey, who's a billionaire based out of California. Don Hankey is kind of an interesting guy. You know, he's a really numbers focused guy who made his fortune originally in offering subprime auto loans. So this is a guy who's comfortable with looking at people who have sort of marked up credit histories and saying, yep, they've got the collateral. We can afford to do this and we're going to make money on it. And apparently that's what happened in this case. And so uh, going forward, uh, Donald Trump has now the money to cover that bond so that his assets will be protected uh, during the appeal. What did Donald Trump, what do we expect Donald Trump had to put up in order to get this backing uh, to, to do this? Yeah, so one of my colleagues at Forbes just got off the phone actually with Don Hankey. Uh, who said that the collateral for this was a combination of cash and investment-grade bonds. Uh, we knew that Donald Trump had a substantial amount of cash. We estimate his sort of liquid assets cash pile at roughly $400 million right now. What's interesting here is that he's tied up a chunk of that, both with the collateral on this judgment, and then also with collateral for a bond in the E. Jean Carroll case. And combined, you now have the majority of his cash pile wrapped up in collateral for these legal judgments, which is going to limit his ability to operate his business, certainly to expand his business, you know, forget building massive new buildings at Doral or propping up true social with a big injection of cash. Those things would be very, very difficult for him to do at this point. And uh, what, how does this affect any other aspect of his legal predicaments? I mean, when you're when you're evaluating so, the, the risk with, with a borrower, would you want to consider, well, he's a criminal defendant in four different cases? Well, certainly you would. But that being said, you know, lenders, insurance companies, the sorts of people who are going to be entering financial arrangements with Donald Trump, uh, they are people who want to make money. And time and time again, despite the fact that Trump has been accused of fraud, that he's been found liable for fraud, that he's been charged with criminal counts, uh, there have been people willing to do business with him. Now, they might not be the A-list banks. They might be demanding higher interest rates. They might be extracting terms from him. Uh, but there's going to be somebody out there who's going to be willing to put up money. And you saw that in this case. And my suspicion is that you'll continue to see that in the future should he need more liquidity. Dan Alexander, thank you very much for joining us on this breaking news story. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, today, the Florida State Supreme Court decided to give voters the chance to overrule the abortion ban enacted by the Florida legislature. And that has given Democrats new hope in Florida in the November election. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett and Congressman Dan Goldman will join us next. Today, Florida's Supreme Court upheld the state legislature's 15-week abortion ban and a six-week abortion ban that the state legislature passed after the 15-week abortion ban. But Florida voters will have an opportunity to change that in November because in a separate decision today, the Florida Supreme Court approved a ballot measure that would protect abortion rights in the state's constitution on the November ballot. The proposed amendment says, quote, no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. The amendment requires the support of at least 60 percent of voters to be added to the Constitution. If it passes, it would nullify Florida's abortion bans. Florida is one of several states trying to bring the issue directly to voters in this election. Voters in seven states, including Republican states like Kansas and Ohio, have already voted in favor of protecting abortion rights, not restricting them, since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the United States Supreme Court. It is particularly crucial now, given that this new six-week ban in Florida will, as The Washington Post notes, all but eliminate abortion access in the South, while further straining abortion clinics elsewhere across America. Last week, Democratic Representatives Jasmine Crockett and Dan Goldman unveiled a bill to counter abortion misinformation. The bill seeks to ensure accurate abortion access information is available nationwide in response to anti-abortion centers often calling themselves 
crisis pregnancy centers intended to deceive patients. Joining us now, Democratic Congressman Jasmine Crockett of Texas and Democratic Congressman Dan Goldman of New York. Thank you both very much for joining us tonight. And uh, Congressman Crockett, uh, first of all, uh, your reaction to the Florida Supreme Court uh, saying, yes, the legislature can enact any ban it wants, six weeks, but Florida voters are going to get a chance to rule on this. Um, I'm happy and I'm happy. <laughs> I know that there are those that definitely are saying, wait a minute, you know, Congresswoman, how can you be happy about the six-week ban? It is the extremism that is actually motivating people to get up off the couch because they recognize that freedoms are on the line. And so because the Supreme Court allowed this rogue legislature and this rogue governor to do this, I think that this will be a motivating factor. And for once, I may have some faith in Florida. I lost faith after the hanging chads. But hey, November may be a different day um, because we know that every time we've taken this issue to the people, the people have decided overwhelmingly that they want to basically allow our medical providers to assist women in making these very important decisions with their lives. And Dan Goldman, uh, a 60 percent vote necessary uh, for the amendment in November uh, to become law. Uh, it sounds tough, but current polling shows 62 percent. Of, of Florida voters supporting it, including 53% of Republicans supporting it. That's exactly right, and that's consistent across the country, Lawrence. Americans, and especially women, want the right to control their own bodies. And when you look at what the state legislatures and governors are doing in states like Florida, where they are trying to force women who don't want to have babies or risk health issues by having babies to have them, and then you see the Alabama Supreme Court telling women who want to have babies through IVF that they cannot have babies, the only logical explanation is that they want to control women. And this is a battle for freedom. And as a man, it's a battle that is on the line for me, too, not just because I have four daughters, but because the health of my wife may be at risk if uh, abortion care or uh, miscarriage care is not available. Uh, and family planning is on the line. And they're not going to stop here with the freedom to uh, reproductive health. They will continue. They will go after contraception. They will go after LGBTQ rights and gay marriage. They will not stop until the uh, conservative, uh, evangelical, hard right view of the world overtakes this entire country. And I'm glad that we will have an opportunity for Florida voters to make their opinion known. The courts are not going to save us, Lawrence. They're not going to save us against Donald Trump. They're not going to save us against the Supreme Court. We are going to have to get out to vote. Every single person in this country has to make his or her voice heard so that we, the American people, decide that what our freedoms are. Representative Crockett, uh, Joe Biden's position on, on abortion is very clear. He supports Roe versus Wade. He wants to see uh, federal guarantees uh, along the lines of Roe versus Wade. Donald Trump is refusing to say what his position is. Is, it, is, is he for a 15-week ban? Is he for a six-week ban? What is it going to be? And he's a Florida voter, and he's also refusing to say how he would vote on this uh, constitutional amendment in Florida. I think the silence speaks volumes. We know where Trump stands. We know what this Supreme Court has done to decimate our freedoms, just like Congressman Goldman just laid out. Um, you know, it's not really about whether or not you agree with abortion, you understand abortion access. It's about freedom as a whole. And we know that the three Trump justices have absolutely put us into the upside down. This is why we are struggling. This is why the people are having to push back. You know, I wish the state of Texas did have this option because I could almost guarantee you that we would not have people facing up to life in prison if the people had an opportunity to choose. And the fact that it is a 60 percent threshold, they thought that that was going to be what they could do in Ohio to win. But we saw overwhelming number of people come out. And so honestly, this was probably the wrong fight to wage at the wrong time when they are trying to take the White House back. 
we know that Arizona is pushing to do the exact same thing. And so I am looking for good things out of Arizona. I'm looking for good things out of Florida. And anything that we can do, we're going to do. And I think it's really important that Dan is one of the people that brought this bill because Dan is in New York. And we know that there are those that believe that if you're in New York or California, that you're safe. But they are trying to push a nationwide abortion ban, and we are going to push back. Uh, Dan, on the legislation uh, that you and Representative Crockett have introduced, uh, it, it's about getting clear information out there for people about this. And now that we see with Florida, basically the entire South uh, has an abortion ban in place in one, one way or another. Uh, New York is one of the places people are wondering about in those states that have banned abortions. Uh, what, what will your bill do to help people in these states living under abortion bans? Well, the first thing it will do is it will provide a central repository of accurate information where people can go to figure out options for themselves. And whether it's to come to New York or go to Massachusetts or go to other states where that welcome women who need abortion care, uh, they can find it there. But it is also designed to stop the malicious and manipulative efforts by so-called crisis pregnancy centers to woo women women into their centers by appearing as if they are a Planned Parenthood or the like, and then um, manipulating them and convincing them not to have an abortion. In New York, there are 13 crisis pregnancy centers, and there are five Planned Parenthood centers. So this bill will require a lot of a lot more truth in advertising, so to speak, for these crisis pregnancy centers, uh, which are really a scourge on women's rights. Representative Dan Goldman and Representative Jasmine Crockett, thank you both very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, our next guest, Congressman Colin Allred, is now running in a tie in the state of Texas against Senator Rafael Edward Cruz. Colin Allred, the Democrats' big hope in Texas, joins us next. Today, the Biden-Harris campaign released a new campaign memo saying that it sees the state of Florida now as winnable after today's Florida Supreme Court ruling allowing Republican Governor Ron DeSantis' ban on abortion to go into effect next month. As we just mentioned, Florida's Supreme Court also ruled that voters in Florida will be able to vote on an amendment in November that would guarantee abortion protections in the Florida state Constitution. In other states, other Republicans running for election this year are showing a new vulnerability because of the Republican Party's attacks on reproductive rights. A recent poll from the University of Texas found incumbent Republican Senator Cruz is tied, tied at 41 percent against his Democratic challenger, Texas Congressman Colin Allred. 52% of Texas independents have an unfavorable view of Senator Cruz compared to just 17% for Congressman Allred. As the U.S. Supreme Court considers restricting the abortion pill, the Texas Democratic Party released a statement reminding Texas voters that Senator Cruz is leading the charge to ban of the abortion medication and that Senator Cruz supports outlawing abortion with absolutely no exceptions. Joining us now is Texas Democratic Congressman Colin Allred. He's the Democratic nominee for Senate in Texas, and you are tied at 41 uh, percent. I mean, getting to a tie at any point in this race against a Republican in Texas is impressive. You're at a tie with enough time yeah. to move that number up. Yeah. Well, you know, we know that this has always been uh, something where in Texas, our task is to get more of our fellow Texans out to vote. But what we're seeing also is that Texans know who Ted Cruz is. Mm -hmm. We know what he wants to do. We know what he hasn't done for us over the 12 years that he's been misrepresenting us in the United States Senate. And we're ready to move on. And so now my job is to make sure Texans know who I am. Because we, we do have an uphill climb in Texas at, at times, but I'm used to that. I was born and raised in Dallas by a single mom, was a public school teacher, and I made it to Baylor, to the NFL, became a civil rights lawyer be a 22-year incumbent Republican congressman just to get into the Senate, just to get into Congress. 
Uh, and now we have a chance to take out one of the worst senators in the country. I know we're going to do it. So uh, the, the, move, the, the polling on independence in Texas seems to be the spot where if there's a victory for you, that's where it's going to be, because they are heavily against uh Senator Cruz now, their unfavorability of him is astronomical. And yours at 17 percent, the audience should just know. No one gets a zero. You, you, you usually, just by seeing the word Democrat or Republican, you get some unfavorable, you know, besides someone's name. But 17 percent is about as low as it gets. Yeah. Well, you know, I think Texas has a long tradition of independent leaders uh, who put Texas first uh, and are, have national, you know, national profiles, but are always Texans uh, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. We've gotten away from that uh, in recent years with these followers like Ted Cruz, who follow whatever they're told to do, even if you, you know, talk about his family and call him everything but you know, a child of God. Uh, and that's not who we are as Texans. I think we need to get back to that. But I think you're right when you talk about there are folks out there who are wondering, you know, where are we going to land? Which way which should we go? Because you know, I might have been voting for Republicans in the past, but I don't see myself in this version of the Republican Party. And those folks voted for me. Uh, that's how I got uh, into Congress, representing a you know, part of Dallas that was traditionally Republican. Uh, and I've tried to serve in a way that shows that we can bring folks together. That yes, there are some important fights. You mentioned you know, abortion access and, and access for women to make their own health care decisions. These are important fights that we do have to have. But not everything has to be a fight. Mm -hmm. For example, when 30 million Texans are freezing in the dark, that's also not a good time to go on vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to, you know, when you come back, uh, make jokes about it. Texans don't accept that. And so that's what I think you're seeing showing up in these numbers. Our task over the next few months, of course, is to make sure the Texans and Americans know that we can get rid of Ted Cruz here. We can put someone in the United States Senate who cares about all 30 million Texans, not someone who just cares about himself. When I was in the, in the NFL, we had guys we called me guys who were only looking out for themselves. Ted Cruz is the ultimate me guy. I'll make sure I'm looking out for all of us. And Texas has already delivered because of the restrictive abortion laws there some of the most tragic and difficult yeah. cases we've heard of women being put through horrible ordeals because of Texas Republican yeah. governing choices, which Ted Cruz supports completely, uh, including his belief that there should be absolutely no exceptions to any ban on abortion, no exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest. Yeah. Well, you know, I really feel for what's happening in Florida, as much as I'm excited about them having this on the ballot. What they're going to experience is what we've been experiencing in Texas, which is what a near total ban on abortion looks like. And what it looks like uh, is 26,000 women in Texas who've given birth to their rapist child. Uh, what it looks like is a mother of two like Kate Cox or Dr. Austin Denard, who was my uh, guest at the State of the Union, who uh, wanted to have a much wanted third pregnancy, who got the news that we all hope we don't get, uh, that the pregnancy wasn't viable. And in Kate Cox's case, she had to go to the emergency room four times. Her doctor said she needed a medically necessary abortion. And her state said no. In fact, they didn't just say no. They said, if you do this, we're going to prosecute you, your doctor, your hospital. We have counties saying you can't drive through the county if you're going to use the roads to access an abortion. I mean, how are they going to enforce that, uh, Lawrence? What are we going to do? We start pulling you know, women in Texas over and asking them, what's the nature of your travel, ma'am? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not freedom. And I'm a fourth generation Texan. And there's one thing I know about us. It's that we believe in freedom. And so for folks out there, they should know. The only way in Texas we're going to restore this right is at the federal level by beating Ted Cruz. When I'm in the United States Senate, we will codify Roe v. Wade. We'll go back to the standard we had for the last 50 years. Go to callonallred.com and help us do that. Colin Allred, thank you very much for joining us. Please come back during this campaign. Thanks, Lawrence. And coming up, our next guest, Will Bunch, wrote the wisest and most moving words I have read about the men who were trying to make our lives better, a little easier when they fell to their deaths in the middle of the night when the key bridge collapsed last week. Will Bunch joins us next. Donald Trump says they are poisoning the blood of America. Donald Trump says they are dangerous criminals. But all they were trying to do is make their families' lives better and make our lives better in ways that we would never notice. When we're driving over smooth roads, how many of us think to thank the people who filled the potholes on those roads? How many of us wonder, who does that work? Who does that work in the middle of the night 
on a cold bridge in Baltimore. Now we know. 35-year-old Alejandro Hernandez Fuentes and 26-year-old Dorlian Raniel Castillo Cabrera were found dead under 25 feet of water in the red pickup truck they presumably jumped into a bit too late to try to escape the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge at 1.28 a.m. last Tuesday morning. 38-year-old Menor Suazo, who has not been found. 35-year-old Jose Lopez, has not been found. 49-year-old Miguel Luna, has not been found. Another man whose name has not been publicly released has not been found. There were two lucky ones. Julio Cervantes was rescued, and another worker whose name has not been released was also rescued. Philadelphia Inquirer columnist Will Bunch wrote, quote, Menor Suazo and seven men with stories very much like his, migrants from the neighboring countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico, were filling potholes on the region's major span on a raw March night. They were doing a backbreaking job at a wretched hour, one many other Americans simply can't or won't do, all so their neighbors could drive safely to their warm, comfortable office cubicles in the dawn's early light. Will Budge saw something in that tragedy that Donald Trump and other liars about immigrants will never see. Quote, when the Dolly cargo ship demolished that bridge support on Tuesday, it also obliterated all the ridiculous lies and myths our demagogues have been spreading about immigration. There were no sex traffickers aboard the Key Bridge that night. Nobody was dealing fentanyl. They were not animals, but fathers and husbands, like Suazo and Luna, whose wife occasionally showed up in her food truck to bring them in tacos and pupusas. They were filling potholes so their children could have an even better life. These six workers who perished were not poisoning the blood of our country they were replenishing it. This is a moment of clarity when we need to reject the national disease of xenophobia and restore our faith in the United States as a beacon for the best people, like Suazo. They may have been born all over the continent, but when these men plunged into the, our waters on Tuesday, they died as Americans. Joining our discussion now is Will Bunch, national opinion columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Will, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and thank you for uh, the wisdom uh, with which you wrote about this and what you what you saw in it. Um, tell us about about these men who are out there doing this work that others don't want to do, uh, just trying to make life better for their families and make our rides to work a little smoother. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> Lawrence, uh, thanks, thanks so much for those kind words. And, and thanks for having this conversation, because um, it's kind of surprised me, frankly, that this aspect of the story hasn't gotten more attention, because I feel like in this tragedy, we also got a glimpse of clarity into what the, what the true nature of immigration in the United States is all about. Um, you know, in the column, I, I focused a lot on one one of these men in particular, uh, partly because some excellent reporting had been done on him by the Associated Press and others. Uh, this this was uh, Maynor Suazo, who uh, came here at age 20 from a small, uh, very impoverished rural village in the mountains of Honduras. And... Um, this guy just never stopped working. You know, he he supported a wife and, and two children, and yet still he managed to send about 
$600, $800 a month home. Uh, he was able to support relatives back in Honduras. He was kind of a patriarch for uh, some relatives who were able to make it up to the Baltimore area. And, um, you know, he told his family, you know, my philosophy is just I go where the work is. He would, he would get home from this overnight construction crew that he worked on at 5 a.m., He'd sleep for a few hours, and then he would go out at noon and do landscaping or other odd uh, jobs. And uh, that, that, that's what he did, you know. And this, this is really the vast majority of the 10 or 12, you know, million recent immigrants who've come to this country. Um, they've, come here, they've come here to work. They've come here for opportunity. You know, they've come here to support their families. You know, uh, a couple channels over from here— all they want to talk about is the isolated cases of criminals. And, yet, you know, sure, in a population that big, you're going to have a couple of criminals. But, um, uh, you know, like I said in the, in the piece, they're not, they're not poisoning the blood of this country. Uh, they, they're replenishing it, just like the, you know, just like the Irish who, uh, you know, the sand hogs who built the water tunnels under New York just like the Italian Americans who built the Brooklyn Bridge or you know or the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philadelphia this is just a tradition of how America works it's how our infrastructure gets done yeah well i'm looking at the list of the names of the 13 sandhogs as they used to be called who dug the <laughs> Holland tunnel they were all in industrial accidents it was considered part of the job a lot of irish names on that list the, the, the bridge work in this part of the world, the tunnel work in this part of the world has always been done Absolutely. by immigrant labor. That bridge is going to be rebuilt by immigrant labor. It's going to be maintained by immigrant labor. That's how it's going to be able to exist going on. And Will, thank you very much for drawing attention to that. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. Oh, thanks so much, Lawrence. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Will Bunch gets tonight's last word. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.